Hello, everybody. Welcome to the podcast Life Journeys with Karen Verhaast. And we are here in the house of Karen Verhaast in Belgium. Welcome, Karen. Hello. Thank you for receiving me. Uh-huh. Uh, and we are having this podcast because Karen was participating in a book which is called Purpose. And I first would like to introduce you, Karen, uh, because I found you, uh, I find you a very intriguing person. Mm-hmm. And um, I think it's really worthwhile knowing more about you and uh, telling our listeners or our public uh, to what you're doing, what you did in your life. And so first of all, I would like to introduce you as uh, a senior leadership consultant, an executive coach who was uh, associate, associated with Oxford leadership and working globally with management teams and leaders. Karen has over 35 years of experience, professional experience as a change agent, and mostly two international careers in IT. Karen's passion is to be a companion, a compagnon de route, mm-hmm. companion uh, of the way, as we say it in English. And she's serving as a catalyst for leaders and organizations to connect with what is deeply meaningful to them and to help them move into that direction. Karen is based in Belgium, where she runs a B&B with her us artist husband. And she's also a wife, daughter, sister, godmother and stepmother. She's a traveler and map maker of love, of life, loving to roam, to roam and to connect with the world at large. Karen loves art, nature and movement. Her key values are authenticity, spaciousness, gratitude and connection. And when I'm saying all this, Karen, uh, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. And I have read your book that you have been written with uh, several people from the Oxford Leaderships Company. Uh, the book is called Purpose, How Decisions in Life Are Shaping Leadership Journeys with Purpose. So it just got out and it's created by Eve Simon, also from the Oxford Leadership yes. uh, Society. She, she's a colleague of mine. She's yeah. a colleague of you. So my first question was, how did you get involved into this book and, and why are you writing all these stories of all these people mm. uh, on purpose? Okay. Well, first of all, um, Oxford Leadership is a network and we're all independent uh, consultants and coaches. And a lot of our work is actually centered around purpose. Uh, We work with individuals and work with organizations and purpose is very much in our DNA. Um, It's a topic that we love, that we find very meaningful to work around. Mm -hmm. And Eve Simon, the official author of the book, she already wrote a book before with uh, stories by women. And she launched the idea in our community. Why don't we publish a book together with the community on purpose? Um, So she did a call and about 30 of us stood up and said, yeah, I want to participate in this book. Uh, Finally, it ended up containing 22 stories. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think for me to participate, there was a, a couple of reasons. First of all, just the collaboration and the community effort. Uh, secondly, to get something out there on purpose. And thirdly, for me, it was interesting to write my own story. Because mm. just to be clear, this is not a textbook on what is purpose and why purpose is important and uh, the link between purpose and leadership and organizations. But it's 22 personal stories about people's own relationship with um, purpose and their mm. life's journey. Um, mm. So. I found it interesting to put it on paper for myself. Mm. I had shared the story often in talking to participants and in mm. coaching, but I had never put it on paper. So why would would you consider it so important for you to put it in a book? What's the purpose of writing it out and, and publishing it to a broader audience? Um, I, I think I already said that just the collaborative effort yeah. is what really drove this. Um, we also want to make it available to people as a resource because purpose is um, a word that you hear a lot these days. Um, It's become kind of trendy, but at the same time, we notice when we work with groups and individuals that sometimes it's hard to get your hands around Mm -hmm. and also how purpose can be a compass in your life and how it can serve you. I mean, that's that's the other part of it. Mm -hmm. The first part is from discovering for yourself what is driving me, what is really meaningful. But then secondly, also to kind of organize your life around it. And we were hoping that through these stories, people get inspired or get Mm -hmm. some food for thought on what it is, how it works, how it can work for them how it can be a source of energy, how it can also be 
a way to have more impact in whatever it is that they do, even mm. you know the most ordinary job. If it's mm. if there's some purpose or meaningfulness behind it, it's probably going to be lived mm. in a different way. And who, who are the people that can benefit from this from this book? What what's your target audience, or who would get this inspiration, or who would need this inspiration from this book? I think everybody who's sort of looking at um, what is life all about yeah. and how, do, what, you know, what, what do I use as a compass? It's, it's so easy to be lived by external expectations and pressures. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, there's a lot of VUCA as a sort of term, which is very fashionable. The world is so fast moving and there's so much that comes at us. And it's really hard to stay centered mm. in all this busyness. And um, then what is... Who are we really, and who do we choose to be? So uh, it's 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 a, a help for people who are looking for what's my purpose. How how do I stand still in this world, and what's what what do I want to do here? What's yeah, my meaning? I think you know what is my foundation. Yeah. And what what is my contribution? Um, it's also linked to, of course, something that you're passionate about. So it can um, help maybe create some order or some mm. focus in uh, what people want to do. Mm. And then, you know, if I look at my own path, I organize my life gradually. Mm. I organize my mm. life around it. Um, mm. So it, and I think for leaders, it's also, it's very important for leaders and organizations because they have a role also to be a role model. And since um, the world is such a, a, a whirling place, mm. uh, if they're centered in their values and whatever is meaningful to them, that will also create maybe more islands. Some, you know, I have a, mm. a colleague consultant who talks about islands of sanity or islands mm. of health uh, within the turmoil of life. So all, all the authors uh, that participated in the book, they are all uh, consultants, executive consultants, leadership consultants. I've read quite a lot of the stories. They are beautiful and mm. each one of them has its, its own path uh, that he or she went through. What I see is that they all started in, in, in businesses, and then suddenly ch there was this life changing event, or they grew to another completely different area of life. What would you say? With, what is the common ground between all these 22 persons? Um, part of it is corporate experience. Yeah. I think most of us worked in corporate experience, but this is also because in Oxford Leadership, you know, we find it important that people have that background because yeah. we work with corporations. And I, I think we do have a common DNA in Oxford leadership, which is uh, uh, which is linked to um, authenticity, yeah. um, and and people have this quest about um, what does this really mean to show up as an authentic leader? Because even though we're not um, working anymore in the corporate world, most of us, um, there is this question always about leadership. Yeah. You know, even if you're self-employed or even if you're a mom yeah, or a exactly. dad or whatever, yes. yeah. leadership is a, everybody's a leader. This is one mm. of the things that we put forward. But leadership is also personal. So how you live that personally is shaped by what is important to you, you know, mm. what holds meaning and what are your values. Um, yeah. So this is a, a big connector between us, um, this journey that we're all on yeah. towards. Um, and I see when I read the stories, all, all of you guys went through some, very difficult times. Either it was a, a disastrous divorce or, or uh, a partner that died or um, uh, these major events that happen in life. Um, would you say that these experiences are uh, necessary to find the true, your true purpose? Because I see a life before all these major events and then a life after these major events. Would you consider it as a, a necessity to grow in your path? Um, yeah. find your purpose in life? I, I would not consider it a necessity, but I could say that it's a helping condition. Yeah. Um, I mean, life is difficult and there is suffering. And mm. this is one of the things that we notice in our programs is that we all agree sort of on what are the common highlights. It's always experiences of love and connection and what are the common um, sources of suffering. And mm. it's loss, you know, whether mm. it's loss of health or loss of a partner or um, loss of money, you know, poverty. Yeah. Um, so we all share the same notions of what brings suffering. And I think it's in times of suffering that people sometimes are forced to stand still mm. and take a, take a step back and 
go back to the drawing board, so to speak. I think this is what comes mm-hmm. out in many of our stories about, you know, maybe it's a time to make mm-hmm. some other decisions. Um, but it doesn't have to be that way. I think mm-hmm. there's also people that have very happy lives and still can mm-hmm. can be on some kind of quest mm-hmm. around um, what's meaningful for them mm-hmm. and what they're passionate about and, and on a transformation journey. Yeah. So I think transformation journeys can take many shapes, mm-hmm. but it's definitely when you're in periods of suffering, it's a, it's a time to take stock in general, isn't it? And yeah, definitely. And what I find always so intriguing is why does one choose to, because we all suffer from time to time. Yeah. Why does one choose uh, when he or she suffers to react on a negative way and another one on, on a positive way? Mm. And, what what I find very interesting in all these stories is that they transform into a positive way. What do you, would you consider as key elements to find this positive insight after it, or during the suffering? I don't know. You know, it's a question I've been asking myself <laughs> as well, because I notice people around me who are suffering and then their strategy is to either cut, cut down their emotions mm-hmm. and just stay on the train yeah. or... Um, uh, you know, turn to booze or to drugs or whatever. I mean, there's many strategies that people use and yeah. I don't know what it is in the makeup of people that, you know, I, I, I like this word resiliency that mm-hmm. makes some people resilient and it gives them enough energy or enough force to kind of reconsider their options and others not. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I don't know what it is. You know, maybe it's nature nurture. I mean, I, I can even see people close to me through family lines who who deal with suffering very differently than 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 I do. So I don't know what it is. Mm. No, I can't answer that question. Do you think we can or do you believe that it's possible to change by mindset or by by programming like you do in the Oxford leadership mm. programs probably? To really shift that mindset or your heart sets into this positive way of, of looking at suffering or you know, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm I'm triggered by a couple of words that you're saying. I think there's the word mindset, and there was an interesting uh, article by Walter Dupré in the Standard last yeah. week. You know, it's a guy who writes columns, and he was saying that he woke up in the morning and it was six to seven, and he formulated this really positive um, attitude. He called it for himself that day. Mm-hmm. You know, lots of good intentions and. He was really ready. And then at one to seven, he steps out of bed and he jerks with his knee against the bed table. <laughs> and and okay, there was yeah. his positive intention. Um, so there is sort of this school that says you can just kind of shape your mindset. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, I'm, like I'm, like the secret. And, yeah, uh, and yeah. I'm, I'm a little bit ambiguous about it. Um, also positive and negative, you know, like it's binary. The world is not binary. No, There's exactly. all kinds of shades of gray. And I'm, I'm much more intrigued by words like... Um, Kindness, you know, kindness in the sense of we we have different stories about ourselves and we have different stories about others and we have different stories about reality. And to just come from a place of kindness and letting that all be and living mm-hmm. what there is to live, emotions, and etc. Um, and, and gratitude. And um, so that's sort of the one thing that I want to say about positive. The mm-hmm. other thing about shifts, I mean, I, we do notice in the programs that we do, we, we notice amazing shifts and small mm. shifts. I mean, everything on, on a scale is, I think there's something, if you take people out of their day-to-day experience and you get them off the train that mm-hmm. they're on and those trains go really fast huh? and there's lots of traffic and lots of things to think about and you put them in a retreat environment where people get some deep questions that they can reflect on and share on with others. Um, there is room then for some insight to mm. arise and um, it's like we create certain conditions. We mm. create a container where it's safe and uh, where people can reflect. And then there's aha moments mm. and that can be determining or, or mm. not. So that, that can even be small shifts. Mm. Um, I had a person once with ADH, ADAD, ADD, some, mm-hmm. you know, he couldn't, he was addicted to his iPhone and he couldn't hold his hand still. And even his body was just moving all the time. And, the result of this was that he found a, a personal yoga teacher and he bought himself an alarm clock so he would stay off his phone till after breakfast. And he had an agreement with his wife. And I, I stayed in contact with him. It did change mm. the fact that, that people realize I can actually recenter. I can actually step back and mm. get off that train and stand on the balcony and look mm. at life. 
that's already a big thing, yeah. I think. Um, I'm glad you mentioned the words uh, kindness and gratitude and thankfulness. It seems that we, by by getting more distance from, from churches and relig religious life that we went through to the past and that it's in Western society is very far away, that we lost the, the meanings and, and of these of these words. Mm. Um and what it's actually how it's actually good to, to be thankful. Mm. Um you know, so there, there's, there's what's a, your opinion on that? Well, you know, I found I found it really interesting. There's a person at one point in time to, who said to me, I grew up as a Catholic and I mm. went to Mass every week until I was about sixteen. Um churches are places for reflection you know mm. you went there you know you can think whatever about the church as an institution and i have my own thoughts around that yeah. but just the ritual of going to a place once a week to just stand still and reflect mm. on your deeds and to hear some texts which are all based on i mean in the original teachings it's all based on love yeah i think that exactly. shapes people and mm. you know the question is indeed these days um what replaces that mm. and apparently the younger generations are really looking also in their this research done that they want to work for organizations with a purpose that contributes to a better world so mm. it's shifting to, to, diff to different it's taking different other shapes mm. and forms maybe mm. um so it's it's interesting what's going to lead to yeah. in the long term i once was at the congress of an american uh, philosopher i forgot his name now who was saying we have to create a new story, mm. you know, Christianity or Buddhism, but we have to create a new story for the whole world. Mm. If I would say, ask you, what, what kind of story would you like to have created for the whole world, Karen? Me? Yes. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Is that important? <laughs> I don't know, but, but, but what would you like? What, if, there, if there would be such um, a story, oh. what would you like to, to have? What would you like to have seen? That it, contain, that it contains the story. Oh, my goodness. I mean, this is a big question. Yeah. And I'm sort of get caught. I'm sort of caught by... <laughs> yeah, just come. It's not, it's not yeah. that we prepared, but just... I've, yeah. What, what would you like to... What would there... Uh, you know, I, I think there's certain elements, and I think they're part of my own um, foundation at this point, that there's something that is, that is basic goodness, yeah. you know, which is a, a notion in Buddhism. Uh, there's just as basic goodness in the world and to see the good and to do good. Um, I think there's that. Um, I'm also a firm believer of s small steps and, and stopping once in a while, you know, yeah. something that would be part of my story as well, uh, to just stop and, and look back and reflect, to connect the dots and, and to, to think about what, what brought me here yeah. in this place. Um, that we're all connected in some way or another. So there's also yeah. something about connection. Um, yeah, and, and to be grateful. I mean, I have this yeah. practice in the evening um, often where I reflect on what brought me joy today or what touched me today or uh, what did I receive? I mean, to just also notice that yeah. we're, we're sort of living in a climate of many people just sort of complaining, social media, media yeah. et cetera. So that would definitely be sort of a counter current, which I would like to see yeah. more of, um, to just be, see, see all the good, which is there. Mm. Is that in these days of rush and hurry, I would, it's almost impossible to do that for many people mm -hmm. because they have to fulfill a lot of obligations, being there with children, their work. Is that one of the causes that, that creates all these burnout uh, epidemics and or would you I don't know how would you look at it I, I mean burnout apparently is also um, according to research it's also because people lose their sense of autonomy yeah. and they feel like they have no more impact of they have no choice yeah you know I think that's a big one in mm. there um, I think, I mean, unless people are in really atrocious circumstances of war or I don't know what, I think we often have choice. Yeah. Um, and just the, the standing still once in a while um, can give us the opportunity to overlook, to look around and see mm. are there other options than the option that I'm currently mm. in, um, at least to think about it. And the thing about, yes, we live in a very fast world, but 
you know, I often take the train and I'm usually working on the train, but even to just kind of once in a while to look outside and look at the landscapes and see a beautiful tree or see mm. how the, the sunlight is coming through. I mean, these are all what I call full stop. You know, mm. you just kind of stop your train of thoughts and you just uh, enter another realm. For mm. me, it feels like another realm, really. I talk a lot in my story about spaciousness. You know, spaciousness mm. is a very important concept for me, sort of this mm. this notion that um, a lot is possible and there's a lot out there, which is good. Mm. Mm. Beautiful. Beautiful how you describe that even in the train, while you're working, you can still find your moments of spaciousness mm -hmm. and calmness. Yeah. How did you find that? How did you get to, to this attitude or because it's is it an attitude or is it something i think for me it's it's been a core need mm. you know even as a child i remember growing up in a urban environment and craving a place where i would just have nature all around mm -hmm. um, so this was as a small child that i was already sensing that um, i think the spaciousness which i also lived as a child was the desire to be the space who I wanted to be and not have to mm. have my life dictated by external expectations. So I think I had a craving deep down in my soul or whatever yeah. in me. And um, I've gradually given it shape to just through being in nature, through uh, meditation, through writing, through dance, through yoga. I mean, there's many practices mm. which I've explored and which I still do to this day. That, that bring that back. And I, I think it's also, um, it's I think it's so much in me now that it's be also become, from a craving, it's become a gift. Yeah. Um, I, I get the feedback from people that this is what I bring. Um, mm. This is what I sense uh, when they're around me. Uh, but it had, I had a deep need. See, this is purpose and need. It's very often linked yeah, together. Yeah, yeah. Our contribution, what we want to bring, yeah. is often something that we also want to give to ourselves. Yeah. It's beautiful how you describe uh, also in, in, in your story, you speak about the lifelong quest for space and meaning. Mm. And what I often sometimes feel myself when, when I'm reflecting on, on what I'm doing, what I'm think I ask myself, Stan, is it really worthwhile? Stop now reflecting and just mm. do what you need to do or what you have to do. Yeah. Um, don't you sometimes wonder... Why can't I be like normal, normal, or people who don't ask all these questions? Or doesn't it? It seems like other people don't yeah. are not asking these questions. Or am I mistaken? It's it's. Uh, I mean, there's two things that you're saying. There, quests for meaning and um, normal people. I don't feel it like it is a quest. Mm -hmm. I'm just plain curious. Mm. Period. <laughs> I've always been really curious just about other people. Even as a child, I would just love sitting behind the window and watching the people in the street go by and make up stories about them. Um, so I'm just plain curious about life and about many things. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, quest kind of contains this notion that there's a place to get to. Okay. And for yeah. me, there's no place to get to. Um, I also consider my relationship to my purpose and my values to be a very dynamic one and a shifting one over time. I mean, mm. as I get older, this stuff kind of solidifies a little bit more, uh, but it's a dynamic relationship. And the thing about normal people, yeah, what is normal people? Yeah, exactly. When yeah. I was saying the word, I was like, no, 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 this is not, this I is mean, not, I'm, it's, maybe it's quite I'm, a judgment. I mean, I'm not conventional. Um, if I compare myself to people from my generation mm -hmm. and if then... You know, my life has been unconventional, but you see more, exactly. you see more, That's the better more word. of yeah. that among yeah. younger people. Mm. You know, there's much more agility or courage to kind of mm. go out on a limb or to do something totally mm. different or to explore. Or there's many more options than um, when I grew up. To continue on that, because in, indeed, uh, unconventional is a better word than, than, than normal. Uh, you yeah. did not, as you write, you did not follow the path of careers and marriage. And it's quite interesting when you, when you write down, um, it looked more like closing doors. Mm. Uh, closing doors than other doors open? Or... Yeah, I think the biggest door that opened for me was moving to California yeah. when I was 25. And if I look at my life before... Um, I did feel like I didn't fit. Yeah. Um, I didn't like what I saw around me or what was put on me, and, but I had no clue of who I was. I, I just had this amazing craving of I want to be something else, but I don't know what. 
Yeah. And um, so my move to California, uh, this is why I felt like, okay, I can down the, go to the career path and I can go down the, the marriage path, um, but it's not going to be fulfilling and it's not going to be feeding this question which I have yeah. or answering this question <laughs> which I have about who am I really. And uh, so when I was in California, when I moved to California, when I was 25, um, all of a sudden I found resonance. Um, I found people that were different. Um, I found schools of thought um, and I could explore many things mm. and kind of start shaping who I, who I was or find out more about myself. Mm. And um, yeah, so, so that's sort of what happened. Yeah, something mm. did open, but it had also had to do with, with a move. Mm. Um, because I escaped. A physical move? I, I moved physically to California. Yeah. I had to, and it just sort of happened to come my way. And it was just the best thing that could have happened to me. Um, because uh, I just had a really hard time being here. Mm. And then, of course, the first couple of years being there and exploring were not that easy either because then you're like in a big candy store <laughs> and there's all these options and it's like okay but which candy fits with me or well, and uh, which candies fit with you for that at that moment uh with you and which one didn't fit maybe that's even more interesting i, I you know i was wonderful just being in the it uh the beginning of the it explosion yeah and what I learned about myself that I am an early adapter. You know, I became vegetarian at the time. I started meditating. I started doing yoga. I was working in a geek environment mm -hmm. and with all my tears. I just loved it. Um, and then, you know, whenever I would come back and I would share this here, people wouldn't understand because I was an early adapter, so, yeah. so to speak. Um, so these are things that still fit with me, you know, at that time, the things that, uh, that came my way. Um, just I'm always curious about new new shapes or new forms which are which are occurring. You know, like IT was at the time. So what's coming now? What's the next wave? Mm -hmm. What is uh, what is emerging? Is always uh, something that I'm passionate about. Um, and, and what is that for you now? The new wave. Well, what I'm looking into now, it's of, of course a question which I'm personally confronted with is eldership. Okay. Yeah. Um, and eldership. I'm also taking care of an, an aging mother, and so the, you know, there's a, there's a bunch of things with that are associated with that. It's like, um, how can you, in a meaningful and graceful way, li living mm. as an elder, and how does society respond with that? I mean, mm. I'm also now involved. This is something I do on a volunteer basis uh, with an organization who's trying to construct uh, within Belgium. Um, a different type of community which is organized around eldership and care mm. and um, so I find that intriguing and there's things which are emerging and popping up around that and uh, to kind of work mm. with that in terms of the context but also in terms of myself very often an elder is put in a position of a mentor uh, but elders are also still curious and maybe mm. want to do crazy and new things and mm. um, is there room for that and I'm self-employed, so I'm luckily I sort of have the choice, sort of to still go out there and and learn and mm. and do new things. But in, in organizations and corporations, very often a different story. Um, that there is this end of career kind mm. of thing, even though you might still be passionate mm. or whatever. So it's a big. We're aging. Yeah, so I, I, and we all do. We're, we're all do, and we're getting older and older. And how does one deal with that personally? And how does society deal with that? And how do, do organizations yeah. deal with that? So that's yeah. that's an area of exploration for mm. me right now. Um, well, maybe just go go back a little bit uh, back into time. What were for you? Uh, you were, you were quite a new ager, and in, mm. in your younger, you experienced a lot, and you went to California and. As you said, uh, you were an early adapter. What were for you the the three major life events that 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 you would say I flipped here? This, this was for me a change maker. Um, I, I think it's really hard to limit it to three. Yeah. Um, or the major one. Yeah, yeah. I, definitely the move to California. Mm -hmm. um, I spent a lot of time in India in meditation ashrams, so that was um, also having a big impact on me and and. The foundation which I built mm. for myself. Um, 
And then uh, I would say a couple of losses which I had, you know, the mm. loss of my partner and the, the, the burnout which I had in that period, which basically stopped me in my tracks for about five months. I couldn't yeah. work. I couldn't function. Um, and I had a bicycle accident a couple of years ago, which was like a mini repetition of, of this in terms mm. of, you know, I, I hit the floor full force at 30 kilometers an hour. It's like you're definitely stopped in your tracks. Um, yeah. And uh, to reconsider. Um, and I think maybe building onto that, you know, going back to your last question, another area which interests me now as well is since as an old elder, you become more interested <coughs> in the, the what happens with your body. I mean, it's become much more on the forefront. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the body is also a really good doorway to transformation. So this is another area that I'm keen to explore and that I am exploring. It's like what kind of practices I can incorporate in my work with leaders that work through the body and that make shift changes possible through the body, you know, embodiment work and mm. being more conscious of what's, what's alive in terms of feelings and emotions in a body sense, because so much is focused on the mind and changing the world through the mind mm. or changing one's world through the mind where the body and um, emotions and feelings are such resources also to, mm. to make shifts happen. That's very interesting because how would you incorporate that into the corporate business world where you're working? I think there's more and more openness, like mindfulness yeah. has yeah, become a very yeah. acceptable notion within mm -hmm. the corporate world. So uh, it's more and more acceptable to, to integrate things like a body scan or mm. a short yeah. meditation. Um, and then there's also practices which are very non-threatening, which at least make people aware of how they show up, their posture, um, how they stress up in stress situations, what's the mini shift they can do to kind of relax, at least on a bodily mm -hmm. sense and thereby also on a mind sense. Um, so it's, it's, it's very small practices mm -hmm. that are easily accessible and uh, that are also based on, on firm neuroscience findings. Yeah. So um, it's much easier to position these days than it used to be. Yeah, yeah. because uh, when I speak to leaders um, and manager, I often do interviews. They all speak about energy and intuition, and all of them. Yeah, it's it's it's. I what 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 I see is that all these major leaders or CEOs, they have some kind of spirituality or a, a practice that keeps them close to themselves, mm -hmm. uh, in one way or another, through meditation or through body work or whatever. Um, how would you, how would you describe the work, the word of, of spirituality? And is it connected with with purpose, or um, is it something that you would say mm, this is something completely different? Or well, spirituality is such a broad word, yeah, isn't it? Exactly. Um, you know, I, I kind of, and it's so personal. Also, I think it's something that which is beyond language. I mean, what yeah. is one's relationship with the overall sense of life, or the overall sense of why we're here? Um, and then spirituality and religion, you know, there's also yeah. that and, yeah. and what's the difference. So I find that quite a, a, a difficult um, thing to answer. And very often it's very personal and something people mm -hmm. do not talk about very often. Um, but it's to Is have a, yeah. a sense of, of something bigger. I think we all want to contribute. Yeah. And um, and very often this is this is based on, on values that we find important that yeah are often fed or shaped also through religion or spirituality. Yeah. Is it also something that, that, that one, one finds through these major, I know at, at 40s you had this shitty job, you had your burn, your burnout, yeah. um, your boyf boyfriend uh, died at the same time. How did you get over this or how did you get through this period? I mean, the first thing that I really had to do, I mean, I had no choice there was just to grieve. Yeah. Uh, just to grieve and to, uh, uh, to to deal with the loss, which was also an interesting experience because mm -hmm. I remember at the time that I wanted really to have a wailing wall, you know, like a in, wailing wall, like in Jerusalem. Where, I mean, I mean, there's ah, yeah, okay, yeah, 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 yeah,
in the Middle East, when somebody dies, like there's actually even women that come and wail and cry. Yeah. You know, yeah. Very kind loudly. Of, to, to kind of release, <laughs> so to, to release that energy even yeah, was, exactly. was, kind of, yeah. was kind of hard to do. It's not social, people are socially not very comfortable with, with yeah. it in this, in this uh, part of the world. So there was just the grieving and a lot of self-care. Mm. Um, I went on a yoga retreat. I spent a lot of time in nature. I took a, a mindfulness course just kind of to just, I mean, because I felt like the, I had a short circuit in my head. Like I, I, I had the impression that signals were not passing. I had very low tolerance towards noise. I couldn't remember anything. So I had to do stuff to kind of rewire my head. And mm -hmm. this, this is all, this is what I did. Basically focusing on my, my body and, and going, going back to a place of, um, or at least the capacity to create some uh, some stillness and some joy mm. again, but it was a mixed bag with lots of grief and tears and quite some emotions to, and allowing that to happen as mm. well yeah. and being with that. Is that something that uh, that you find? How shall I say this allowing part of just being and accepting what what's what's coming up in your body and your life and just allowing it to be. Well, you know, I, I think it's interesting if you look at, at at small children, how comfortable they are with their body and how natural emotions come. Mm. <laughs> so I, I often wonder, you know, and then everything is great, right? You know, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. so what happens through our lives? It seems like part of our life is having to undo some of the, the, the criticism or the, yeah whatever it is the harness that we put mm. around certain parts of ourselves and mm. just coming again to a place of accepting that exactly that's, i find it always yeah. it's really weird <laughs> it's it's i find it always interesting when, when when children are mad you know they stand their feet yes yeah like releasing this energy like like the the woman crying in the yeah. middle east they're releasing the energy yeah. and it feels like here in the rest the western world we're like we, we've learned to be quiet and, and not to move and not to show anything. And mm. it keeps a lot of these negative energies inside of you, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah, yeah it does. Yeah. yeah. So any form of uh, of just getting in touch with that and, and yeah. working with those energies and doesn't mean that you have to express them in a destructive way. No, just, no, no. Yeah, yeah. 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 Mm. You got married in a, in a Buddhist center. A You're, Buddhist ceremony. A Buddhist ceremony. Yes, not a Buddhist how, center. How, a Buddhist ceremony, excuse me. How did you, how, how did you find that? Uh, where does this uh, idea came from? Uh, or, it was just, actually, it was just circumstantial. Uh, I got married in San Francisco and uh, my the, the man who I consider to have been my Buddhist teacher for the last 20 years, uh, he happened to be there for a symposium. And so I said, would you marry us? And this is what happened. And it was yeah. very short and it was very beautiful. Uh, well, was it was it the kind of... Um, we spoke a little bit about the loss of the church and the rituals. Yeah. The necessity of, of, of having something, a ritual to, to, um, uh, to show out the love of, of, between two people or to, to express it. The bound um, between... Is, is the ritual a necessity for that? For me, there was a necessity. Yeah. yeah. For me, I found it very important yeah. to have a ritual around it, and to, uh, and it was very well fitting, and it was beautiful. Mm. So, uh, so yeah. So that's what happened. Uh, beautiful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's 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 a very nice story uh, uh, that you're describing in in the book. We are coming almost to the end of the of the podcast, Karen. Mm -hmm. But I would like um, to ask you becoming aging of aging or considering that you're uh, working on uh, or thinking about the eldership and mm -hmm. what would you like to leave behind how would you like to be remembered mm -hmm. your legacy you know what panamarenko the belgian artist yeah. in his last tv interview answered to that yeah. does that matter <laughs> <laughs> why is that important and to be honest you know <laughs> it's not a question on my mind what you know what is my legacy maybe it's part of my belgian modesty or something but, uh -huh. um it's it's what's more important for me is is what am i known for and not known in the sense of having a reputation but no. just just who am i known as um i mean my 
a compagnon de route is, is what, what drives me to be a compagnon de route, whether it's to clients or whether it's to my family or to whoever who is on my path and to have some sense of kindness and to bring some spaciousness. And uh, that, you know, like I think the last sentence in my story says, that's all I have to do to, to be. <laughs> and that's more than doing. And that's already enough, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, that's, that's it. So, it's a beautiful end of your story. Mm -hmm. It's all I have to be. Yeah. That's all I have to do. It's, I forgot how I said it, but it was something about mm. being and the doing. You know, it's not about the doing, it's about the being. It's about um, the being. And of course, it continues to be a, not, not a quest, but it's like a, a, it's daily to set some kind of intention. And yeah, sometimes I'm not that. Sometimes I'm just something else. Mm. And then that's, that's what needs to happen apparently at that moment and to be, uh, to be kind with that as well. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, Karen. Okay. Thank you very much for your inspiring story, for all these inspiring stories, and that uh, that you that you all brought these stories together. Where can we find the book, actually? Because you gave it to me. Yeah. But where can we buy the book? It's uh, it's on uh, right now. It's print on demand. Um, all the proceeds go to a, a green project, and it's uh, right now only available on Amazon. There's going to be a new edition in a couple of weeks, which is going to be better in terms of all the mistakes will be taken out uh recommendation is for those in europe to order it via amazon in germany because the print on demand quality in the uk is okay. really poor so uh don't use that shop if people would like to uh and there's an e there's a kindle or an e-version as well okay. I think, on the amazon yeah, yeah. if people would like uh to be part of your compagnon de route in your bnb &B, how can they find you, Karen? I don't even have a website. <laughs> <laughs> so they have to contact me then. Uh, <laughs> I, will, I, I will put your name for it. Yeah, I don't know which data you were. Uh, it's called actually BMB Four Corners and it's in Ghent. So if you, uh, if you look for that, and I called it Four Corners because it's one of my favorite parts of the world where the four states in California come together. And also because um, I opened to BMB shortly after my return in Belgium after... Mm. 15 years of absence and I wanted to call on people from the four corners of the world to come stay with me because I was on a Belgian based job only working in Belgium and I was missing the international contact and uh, so that's why I opened to BNB and it's still alive after 20 years and it's still called four corners so everybody's welcome in your place everybody's welcome yes Thank you very much, uh, Karen, for this podcast, for sharing your story. It's uh, an inspiration for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wish you all the best with your with your job, with the eldership, mm -hmm. uh, with your Airbnb and everything that you're doing in life. Okay. And just be. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>